hi everyone it's 10 o'clock but we're expecting a few more participants so we'll just give a little bit more time for people to arrive Liam, do you reckon we should make a start? I reckon we can admit people as we go if there's any stragglers. Yeah, all right. <clears throat> well, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, the forum today is to explore the impact of the Tasmanian government's proposed changes to the gaming market in this state. The focus of this forum, though, is on the changes to the licensing of electronic gaming machines, otherwise known as poker machines. Before we dive in, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, which for me here in Nipaluna, Hobart, is the Muanina people of the Southeast Nation. This land was never ceded, and the sovereignty of the Palawapakana people continues across the Trubuta, Tasmania. I pay my respects to elders past and present, and to the emerging leaders who continue the work of caring for country and fighting for rights and recognition. This is a fight we all have a part to play in. Just some housekeeping before we start. Please mute your mics during the presentations, but you're welcome to leave your cameras on. We're recording it though, so if you're gonna have morning tea, you might wanna turn it off. Um, if you're not familiar with Zoom, you can access the mute chat and raise your hand functions by hovering your mouse at the bottom of the screen. And it's a fairly small group today, so we really invite you to raise your hand and ask your questions um, on the screen. But of course, you can type it into the chat and my colleague Liam will be monitoring that. He's also going to put his email address there in case you have any tech issues and should be able to help you out. If we don't get to all the questions, which I think we probably will, we've got enough time. And as I say, a small group, we'll, we can follow questions up with John afterwards. Um, so anything you post, anything you post in the comments um, or the chat section won't be captured in the recording. Now to introduce John Lawrence. John spent his early professional life working as an economist and then spent over 30 years as an accountant in public practice. He's currently a public policy researcher and writer. He's also a non-executive director of a tourist hotel with electronic gaming machines. John's joining us via a satellite connection, which isn't 100% reliable. So if he drops out, please be patient. Also online with us is Meg Webb, member of the Legislative Council, and you probably know a long-time campaigner for reducing harms caused by poker machines. After John gives a brief introduction or overview of the legislation, Meg's going to talk to us a little bit about the consumer protection measures we could, should be looking at in the context of the proposed new framework for gambling in Tasmania. Um, now I'd like to hand over to John. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, hello to all of you. Uh, I, 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 I want to talk about the, the, the financial aspects and the, the economic aspects. The, the, the financial aspects uh, will take up most of my time. I'll, I'll spend about 10 minutes, perhaps. Uh, if, if I start running over that, Charlie, just pull me up a little bit, will you? Uh, now, as for the, uh, what I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about mainly about uh, pubs and clubs, 
uh, I won't, we'll, 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 I'll talk a little bit about casinos, uh, but uh, pubs and clubs, I'll just talk about gaming machines. I, I, at this stage, I, I wasn't, wasn't going to talk about Kino, but I'm, I'm quite happy to later if people want to talk about Kino. Now, in, 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 when, when we talk about pubs and clubs, uh, gaming machines in pubs and clubs, I, I'm going to talk a lot about super profits. Now, su super profits are, 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 are profits that are made in excess of normal profits common to the hospitality industry. It's, it's conceptually, it's a fairly, it's a fairly easy concept. They, they're just profits over and above what you would, you would ordinarily earn in a, in a bar situation or a food situation. So now, now, now where we are currently, currently pubs and clubs, uh, the, 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 they, they receive a commission from uh, from, from federal uh, from from network gaming the, from the fed, that's the federal hotels component of, uh, the, on the gaming side of things. Now the, the, currently they receive 30 percent commission. Now even though they only receive thirty percent, that there are still super profits in in pubs and clubs. I, I, I've written a recent blog and I, I estimate currently super profits are, are about eight and a half million. Now. Now I've based that on on the latest turnover figures for 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 player losses that have just been released by the Gaming Commission, and that and the the player losses uh, for the, the recently completed year 2021 were actually 117 million, which is the highest we've seen since 2011-12. So it's 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 certainly uh, turned around the, the slow decline over the years. So it's the highest we've seen in almost 10 years, the latest losses. So I, I've done my calculations based on that. Uh, similar, similarly, just as an aside, there's been a, been a there was a pickup in casinos too, because the casino turnover, player losses in casinos were actually 77 million, which is, as, uh, which is the, the most it's been for since 2015-16. Uh, so there's about eight and a half million worth of super profits in, in, in with the existing arrangements. Now of, of that, of that federal hotels probably get about 3.7 million. Now that 3.7 million, that, that, that represents super profits of about 300,000 per venue. They have 12 venues. So they currently get about three, they're generating 300,000 Per, per, per venue spread across their, you know, across their, their 12 pubs. Now that's just the pubs. Now I'm not talking about network gaming at this point because that's gonna disappear. Now, other pubs currently, their, their super profits average about 75,000. So um, federal hotels about 300,000, the other pubs probably only about 75,000 on average. But there's a lot. There's a lot of stragglers down the bottoms. But the, all, all the uh, all, all, all the pubs with reasonable turnover have, have, make good super profits. So currently, there's plenty of super profits there. But un, under the new arrangements, under the new proposed arrangements by the, 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 the uh, proposed by this future gaming market policy, uh, super profits will actually rise to twenty to twenty eight point five million. They will rise by twenty million. So it's a huge boost from 8.5 up to 28.5. Now, um, fed, fed, federal, federal hotel share will go up to about 9.6, let's say $10 million. That's, that's, all, that, that's what their share of super profits will be under the new arrangements. That, 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 that means on average, their pubs will get super profits of 737,000. Let's say three quarters of a million dollars Will be the super profits uh, to each of their 12 pubs. There'll be some pubs with a lot more hotel, for instance, would be a lot more than that. But on average, across their 12 pubs, that's what I'll get. And and uh, the other pubs, the other pubs will get will, will end up with super profits of 228,000. Now that's based on that's my estimate based on last year's turnover figures. Now, so that's that.
make about just what the level of super profits are in the industry now so if, if by 20 million that that is a million dollars a year now I, I just want to make a point about tax and community service levy uh, from my point of view uh, as an economist that they are one and the same I, I don't normally get into an argument trying to uh, that, that they are one and the same, and, and from my point of view, they should be considered together. Uh, that's certainly the way uh, Greg Farrell sees it too. If you read some of Greg Farrell's submissions to parliamentary inquiries, he, he just views um, tax and, and CSL as one. Uh, to, to me, to split them and talk about them separately, to me, muddies the waters, and it, 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 it sort of opens up the it opens up the, the industry to be able to, you know, to put forward the proposition that, you know, that the, the, uh, the, the CSL that they're contributing is actually, uh, you know, is, it, it is actually a gift from them to, to you know, to, to, to society in general. Now, I, 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 I think that just muddies the waters. I, 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 I prefer to just talk about tax and CSL as one. Uh, and, and, and what's going to happen is that, uh, uh, or pubs will end up with paying CSL of a four percent, but uh, where, where, where it's relevant is that casinos will pay a slightly lesser figure of three percent. But like I say, I, I think of their their tax and their CSL all, all as one. Now, now the thing about tax, that casino uh, uh, poker machine tax, is the way I see it from a, from, from from an economist that. You, 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 you've got to get it clear in your mind about exactly who's paying it. it is, is it really a tax? When you hear me talking, they, they they talk about they talk about poker machine tax as if it's coming out of their pockets. Now th this is this is a completely false premise. To me, it when we talk when we talk about tax because. When we talk about tax on poker machines, it, it, it's exactly the same as GST. Now, nobody, nobody, nobody pretends. I mean, imagine Harvey Norman pretending that all the GST they've collected uh, uh, and, and remitted to the government, say in the last twelve months, is is tax that they've paid in, in, into in, in, you know into into uh, federal hotels coppers. They are not paying the tax. That they are simply remitting it. The, 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 it's it's the punters. It's the punters that pay. It's the punters that pay the GST. And and to me, gam, uh, uh, gambling taxes are exactly the same. Uh, to say to say that the to say that uh, um, uh, pub owners pay pay the pay poker machine tax is incorrect. It's the players that pay it. The, 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 uh, the, the hotels simply remit the tax. Now, to me, to me, it might it, it might sound like an esoteric and esoteric academic argument, to me, but to me, it's fundamental. So we're in a situation where, in in two thousand and twenty-three, uh, the current arrangements are going to come to a to to a complete end. So we're talking about a new arrangement, and all of a sudden, what 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 whatever the, whatever the, the pub owners end up with is a gift from the government, but the players are going to fund it. So to me, you shouldn't talk about you shouldn't talk about tax as 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 a burden by by uh, hotel owners. It's 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 actually it's actually something that comes from the players that government that the government has has mandated. To my, like I say, it might be an esoteric point, but I think it's I think it's crucial. Now, um, um, I, I just uh, just oh, one sec, I just check notes. Uh, under the new range, under the new arrangements, uh, as as I said before, pubs and clubs currently get 30, 30, 
30 cents in the dollar. So I only get 30% of player losses. But under the new arrangements, they'll be allowed to retain 52%. So 48% will go in taxes. That's GST and, and, and uh, the, the other amounts retained by state government, which we call the state taxes. So, so the, the, the amount being retained by pubs will rise from, uh, from 30%. Up to fifty-two percent. So they'll actually, they'll actually, uh, they'll be actually twenty-two cents in the dollar better off. Now, it it, it means for every dollar, every every dollar that they earn, they get fifty-two cents, uh, and 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 they they hang on to just about all of that. They're, once they've paid their fixed costs, which are machine hire and and some of the and some of the the core monitoring core monitoring functions, uh, they're basically left with about forty cents in the dollar of profits. Now that that's an extraordinary that's an extraordinary amount. So there, there, there's there's huge there's huge amounts of super profit being in the industry, which which are going to be give, given to the industry, which uh, uh, which which the which the community or the government should should extract more. Uh, currently, the having a flat rate of taxes the way they do it uh, leaves leaves that some of, some of the pubs, particularly federal hotels, with huge super profits. Um, now, just just on 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 casinos uh, are actually granted a, 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 a even lower rate of tax. They, they've got a flat rate of tax, but they're twenty two cents in the dollar better off. Compared to pubs and clubs, so if, if casinos were taxed at the same rate as currently is proposed for pubs and clubs, but they would have to pay an extra seventeen million dollars a year. So that is the, that is the concession currently being offered to uh, to to casinos based on 2020-21 figures. Casinos, they, they, they had a turnover of 77 million and 22 cents in the dollar equates to 17 million. That is the concession that the, the casinos are being offered. So just, just a brief summary. The new proposal, overall, overall fixed costs will be, slight, will be higher for pubs and clubs because they'll have to pay, not only will they pay the Machine higher costs, but they'll have to pay the, the all, all, all the monitoring and all the monitoring functions, which which currently network gaming do for, 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 for as part of the deal. That, that it, it's no cost, no extra cost to pubs. So it means that the, the a pub's break even point will be slightly higher because they'll have slightly they'll, they'll have they'll have higher fixed costs, but as soon as they reach break even. They'll, they'll instead of retaining thirty cents in the dollar, they'll be retaining fifty-two cents in the dollar. So they'll be once they receive break it, once they get above break even, they're twenty-two cents in the dollar better off. So that that's basically pubs and clubs. Now, just a couple of uh, how am I going for time? Can, can, can I have another five minutes on economics? Yep, I reckon. Yeah. yeah. I'll, 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 just five, just to quickly, the economic arguments. Uh, there's absolutely no basis com for comparing tax rates with other states. It, 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 that's it, it's, there's no basis for establishing our rates, uh, our, our rates here on, on, on other states, because we don't we don't need any interstate capital. There's as much capital here. There's as many people in the queue to to put to put in poker machines. There's more than enough. So we don't we don't need attractive tax rates to get capital here, uh, and also there's, there's there's no need for concessional tax rates for casinos. In 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 the old days, the casinos were were, were, were given low tax rates, but they were because they were trying to they were trying to establish uh, a conference facility. You know, they wanted that was the way it was sold. You know, Tasmania they wanted Tasmania to join the real world and. And get you know, a, a real high-end conference market, and so on and so forth. So they gave them concessional tax rates. 
but but that, that that argument is no longer valid. There's, there's no there's no need for that anymore. There's there's plenty of people out there with there's plenty of other accommodation providers who who will also provide conference facilities and and to, for the, for them to have to compete with uh, uh, with federal hotels who can subsidise their conference facilities with uh, with poker machines that uh, that are funded by locals is, is is just ridiculous. There's no basis in public policy for such a for, 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 for going down that road. Now, uh, as far as handing out all that, as far as allowing all those super profits in for, for pubs and clubs, they're, they're basically, they're, it's basically like giving someone an untied grant. They're, they're, they're getting a handout every year. And there's nowhere, nowhere are untied grants considered good public policy. It's frankly just it's just simply ridiculous to to to, hand, to give to give pubs and clubs uh, a handout on the basis that they may invest in the industry. It's it just doesn't it just doesn't stack up anywhere. Now what what I've said in some of my writing is that it to claw back some of the super profits, we need step tax rates. So the higher the the higher the, the player losses for a particular establishment, the, the greater the tax rate. And also to, to encourage a transition to, to lower impact machines, there, there sh perhaps should be two, a dual system of step tax rates to, to offer in incentive for, for pubs and clubs to offer low impact machines uh, that they can, they can be taxed at a lower rate. That, that, that is one way of getting uh, getting uh, a more appropriate return to to uh, to players, which which is one of the one one of the, the fundamental aims of future gaming market policy. Uh, uh, industry assistance in general. I mean, so, sometimes an industry can justify uh, assistance because of spillover benefits. Into, the, into 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 the rest of the economy, you know, if it, if it produces skills or something that might might spill over to the rest of the economy, but there's no evidence that that exists in the gaming industry. If anything, all, all the evidence points to the fact that there, there's probably spillover costs. There's no spillover benefits. So so as far as the economic arguments go, there is actually zero economic arguments for giving different to giving handouts to pubs and concessional treatments to casinos. Um, and the other, the other thing I, I, I just want to draw attention to is, is the length of the license. The, the, longer, the longer period you, you uh, allow a license to continue, the, the greater the capital gain that, that, that accrues to, uh, to, the, to the owner of that license. Uh, the, 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 there's no problem. You, you give people a long license if, in fact, they're paid a fee up front. So to give them some sort of certainty, but if no one's paying anything up front, they don't, they don't need that certainty. The only certainty they would need is 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 perhaps four or five years enough time to pay off the the leases. Of their of, of their of, of the poker machines that they've been uh, 20, 20 year license, they don't need that sort of certain. A long license is giving them a tax free capital gain, and that's and that's what it's all about. So Charlie, that was uh, that's what they're, they're the few points I just wanted to, to to make at this point in time. That's fantastic, John. Thank you. Um, I'm happy if people have some burning questions now, you can jump in with them or we can move straight on to Meg and um, people can save questions up um, as we go. So, but if, if anyone's worried, they'll forget. Do you want to pipe up with some questions for John? All right, we might move on, Meg. Okay, thanks, Charlie. Hi, everyone. Uh, Thanks, John, that was great. I think what John's just done is really clearly talk through some of the um, aspects that make it very clear that the proposal that's on the um, 
in the legislation to be brought forward from the government is not the best financial outcome for the state. It's designed to favour some parts of the industry, certainly not in, an, in a consistent or equitable, equitable way across the industry. Um, it's not a homogenous industry, it's quite stratified. And this, this policy will affect the different strata of the industry quite differently. And the government have never put on the table any modelling to show what they expect will happen to the pokies industry as a result of this policy. It would be, um, uh, that there's some things we could predict would absolutely occur if this plays out over the next you know, five to 10 years, what will, the, what will change in the industry? And John has talked about um, that some venues like the, the ones that are high earning that are owned by federal group or other large players in the industry will do very well out of this arrangement. Smaller venues won't. So there will be a change of shape to this industry. It would be expected. The government is almost flagged as much really by they've actually included now, um, we see in what they're finally released in the full detail, we see that they've actually put a cap of 25% ownership of any one entity in this industry on poker machines, which I think points to the fact that they expect ownership to become consolidated into owners, into a small number of big owners. Um, and that's interesting. So I think the uncertainty around that, what's the shape of the industry going to look like, is, is there. I think we could expect to see things as they've occurred in other states who have venue licensing models, um, that they'll be, become a suite of very big owners, players that own a, a lot of venues and that their power and influence will become consolidated through this sort of um, model. So that's one thing John's done well to sort of talk through some of those financial impacts. It's not the best outcome for the state. There's no rationale for a lot of the setting of um, taxation rates and things like that. It's certainly, we could be getting a better deal. Um, what I'll talk about too is some of the things that um, are not there um, that mean that not only is it not the best financial deal for the state, it's also not the best deal for us, not the best way forward for us um, socially uh, and in terms of a health and wellbeing uh, aspect. Um, when it comes down to it, there's essentially no reconsideration or new consideration given to harm minimisation or consumer protection in the model put forward by the government. Um, the only gesture towards that space is to say that the community support levy would be increased. Uh, but they haven't in any sense committed to what would be done with that increased bucket of money uh, under their model. So we can't be sure um, even what outcome and what impact that increased CSL will deliver to us as a community. They've made no commitment about that and, and, and it's an uncertainty, so another unknown. Uh, they haven't taken this opportunity of major change to the model and to the licensing and, and taxation arrangements within that model. They haven't taken the opportunity to also give um, appropriate consideration to what changes might come into play and best serve our state around consumer protection and harm minimisation. And that's a space where um, we can actually absolutely be making arguments um, that should be included at this time of major change. Uh, on those on the licensing arrangements and the taxation arrangements and the reality there is we know quite well from very clear evidence from other jurisdictions internationally and from all experts it's very clear what options would be available to us to bolt on to the to the model change uh, to put in place effective harm minimization and consumer protection and so I'll just mention those things um, a little bit here uh, some of you will already be well familiar with them. So excuse me if I'm preaching to the choir about it. The thing to remember is that at the moment, the political opportunity ahead of us is different to the opportunities we might've had in the past, say going into the 2018 state election. So we don't have the opportunity, political opportunity ahead of us in this immediate sense to make arguments about taking pokies out of pubs and clubs. And in, in fact, to make those arguments at the moment may well be counterproductive for us. Um, what we do have in front of us is an opportunity to make arguments for including consumer protection and harm minimisation in this reform as it goes through. And so that harm minimisation and consumer protection would be focused on making poker machines as they exist in our community now in the venues they're in, making them safer. And, and the beauty of arguing for that outcome this time around in this circumstance is that the 
uh, very strong defences the industry puts up and has put up in the past about um, uh, efforts being taking away people's choices or being detrimental to jobs in the industry, those defences aren't available to them on the measures that I'm going to talk about now. So the things that I'm going to talk about are things that would make the machines less addictive and less harmful. And when I say less harmful, I mean less able to take a lot of money quickly. And they're measures that would have absolutely no impact on recreational use of the machines. People using the machines in a genuine recreational way would not even notice they were there effectively. And they would have absolutely no impact on the way a venue needs to be staffed. And so the argument about impact on jobs is removed. So this, that's, there's a clarity to these arguments now around the inclusion of harm minimization that take that where they, they can't be argued against on those previous grounds of argument. So the things that would that we know would work and would be relatively straightforward to implement because essentially they're just programming changes to the computers, which are the machines, are things like a $1 bet limit. Um, in the past, Tasmania had a $10 bet limit. We already brought that down to a $5 bet limit at a certain time in our not, not too distant um, history. There's an argument we could bring that down to a $1 bet limit. Uh, what that does is immediately mean that instead of being able to, to lose, at the moment, you could theoretically lose about $600 an hour uh, if you're betting the $5 bet limit. Uh, bring it down to one, brings it down to about $120 an hour that under the current arrangements, you could theoretically lose. So immediately you can see the, the, the potential positive impact of that. Uh, our SEIS, the Social and Economic Impact Study that we do here every three years, gives us really clear indications about what recreational use looks like in this state. It tells us actually that the, the typical non-problem gambler, a recreational user of poker machines, when they press the button, uh, on average, bet 71 cents. So well under the $1 bet limit anyway. Uh, that's really beneficial. Virtually no one who plays the machines genuinely in a recreational sense would bet more than a dollar each time they press a button anyway. No, they wouldn't even notice. If you combine that with one other thing, even just these two things actually would be quite meaningful. The other thing would be the spin speed. So at the moment we can press the button every three seconds um, and, and lose that at the moment, maximum of $5. Uh, if we extend that time uh, out to six seconds, we just double that time. So they press the button only every six seconds. You can immediately see there the maths of that. You're immediately cutting well and truly the amount of money, how quickly the, um, the money can be taken from the person using the machine. And again, there are different uh, spin speed times in different jurisdictions. Western Australia has five seconds. Um, so there's a precedent there that we can set that at a rate that makes sense for us. Um, six seconds would also be much more reflective of recreational play. So again, we can look at our local research, which tells us that people who are recreationally using the machines, who genuinely don't have a problem, uh, are not pressing the button every three seconds, they're pressing it every five, six, seven more seconds, often quite a longer duration, because they're doing it in a social sense and, and it, they're not doing it there in a, in a way that is um, related to an addictive behaviour. Uh, so just those two things even, just those two things would immediately make the machines far less harmful in terms of how much money they take and how quickly they take it. Uh, then the other things that would come into play that would fit well with that are also programming features are removing um, or bringing down the maximum jackpot. The maximum jackpot is to do with the volatility of the machines and it, it has an impact on how um, extended a period of play can be without being interrupted. So the higher the maximum jackpot, the more volatile the machine, the longer periods you could have without jackpotting. And it's those periods of uninterrupted play that contribute to the addictive nature of the machines. Sitting in front of the machine, playing in an uninterrupted sense where you're just pressing the button, you have the moment of anticipation, you have the dopamine released in your brain, and then the resolution. It doesn't matter to the person who's addicted whether it's resolved as a win or a loss, actually. It's actually the moment of anticipation and the dopamine release that is the effect that they're seeking. A long period of uninterrupted play allows that addictive kind of scenario to be playing out, allows the zone to be there for the person who's addicted. We bring the jackpots down, we bring down the volatility of the machines, they jackpot more often, that in uninterrupted play um, is reduced. So that's a really straightforward thing. Uh, another really key thing is um, 
many of you will be familiar with losses disguised as wins. So you've pressed the button that it's been spinning, it comes up, you've actually lost money, you might have bet a dollar and you get back, you know, 70 cents. And the machine looks like it's celebrating that as if you somehow won 70 cents, but in fact, you lost 30 cents. Um, so let's say uh, those celebrations are a loss disguised as a, a win. It makes it feel like, makes you feel like you won, but you didn't. Uh, and the other thing that is a similar um, effect is near misses where you have, um, you have the little um, dials come up as same, 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 oh, almost the same. You could see the same one just at the top there. It nearly was, it was nearly you. Um, those are programmed to happen much more often than would randomly occur. And again, they kind of keep people playing. They keep people in the space of uninterrupted play. They keep people uh, engaged with the machine in a way that can promote addiction. So losses, disguised as wins and near misses can be programmed to either not occur at all, or at least not occur, or losses, disguised as wins can be programmed to not occur at all, where we don't celebrate a net loss. And near misses could be programmed to only occur as would randomly happen. Um, Again, so those are two straightforward things. Uh, and the other th probably really straightforward things are, uh, are again designed to interrupt people's extended play. And that would be um, regular machine shutdowns. So after a certain period of time where the machine has been in continuous operation, it then would have a break, a 10 or 15 minute break where that machine do it doesn't operate. And the person would have to have a break in their play, would at least have to move to another machine and have a, an opportunity to step out of the zone. Um, further thing we could talk about would be venue opening, like gaming room opening hours. <clears throat> the moment it can be up to 20 hours a day that gaming rooms are opening and, and in operation. Um, there's nothing good really happening in a gaming room before midday or after midnight. So even reducing opening hours to midday to midnight would be to some extent helpful for people in um, uh, being better able to moderate the amount of time that they're in a venue and the availability of the machines in the venue. That's a really quick run through of some very straightforward measures that, as I said, the important thing about them is that they're pretty straightforward. They're either programming or just arrangements in the venue. They have no impact at all, no negative impact on recreational use of the machines. Mostly they would be not even noticed by recreational users. And they have no impact really on the staffing of the venue. Um, I guess the only one that could be argued to do that would be the shorter gaming room opening hours, but you're probably still staffing your venue. If, you, if your venue's open, the bar or whatever it might be, you're staffing it then anyway. Um, so the opportunities here to keep uh, highlighting this unique um, moment in time where this proposal, this reform proposal is coming through, where we're going to be majorly changing how we license machines and changing how we tax them as well. We of course should be taking this opportunity to ask ourselves how we can do better in terms of consumer protection and harm minimization because surely as a government that would be your uh, a key role for you in regulating this industry. Uh, something to pick up on there is this moment in time idea. We have this government has this moment in time where the one license is coming to an end in 2023 and the opportunity for change across the industry, industry-wide change and regulation change uh, is available to them. Something to note about this uh, proposal, the proposed policy and the proposed changes is that it will remove forever that moment in time uh, being available to future governments. So no future government will ever have a moment in time like this again. And the reason for that is not only will we give every individual venue that has poker machines now, we'll give them an individual license for 20 years. So in the first instance, they would all be up in 20 years time. But what's gonna happen is when venues start changing hands as they inevitably will across, uh, in, across the next few years and, and into this new arrangement, if John owns a venue with poker machines and in five, and he's given his individual license under this new model for 20 years, if I come along in five years time and purchase John's venue, what I'm purchasing, I don't just get the remaining 15 years of the license that he had. I'm actually given a start again, 20 year license from that point that I purchased the venue under this model. So that will 
inevitably stagger the license periods in a way we've never seen before. We've only ever had this one license that always had a point at which it came up for review. So always that moment in time for potential change where there's no sovereign risk to anyone. There's no, there's no, um, there's no obligations to anyone for the government in terms of making change. As soon as we see a staggering of license periods, we lose that moment in time forever. Like, like the other Eastern Seaboard states in Australia don't have that, never have that moment in time. And their state governments would always struggle to bring in um, changes or improvements or new things uh, around regulation because of that, because parts of the industry can always kick up a fuss about the impact it's gonna have because they're in the midst of a licensing period and how dare we change the arrangements and change the rules on them in the middle of a, a licensing period. Um, so that's probably a key point to, to, to make too, that, that that's, that's what we risk losing under this, under this model. Um, I've spoken for a good long stretch there, Charlie, that, that may be enough and then people may have questions or want to pick up on more detail about some of those, some of those things. That's fantastic. Thanks, Meg. Um, I have a bunch of questions, but I'm not going to exploit the position of uh, facilitator here. So I'm going to open up to other people first. Does anyone have any questions for John or Meg or for each other? I'll, I'll Meg, I'll, I'll start off. Uh, have, 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 you, have you heard any pushback from, uh, from the, the gaming manufacturers, the machine manufacturers saying that those software changes are, are impossible or harder or not feasible or given a small market like Tasmania, it's not feasible to, to tailor make machines. To, have, you, have you ever heard that argument? Yeah, thanks, John. Um, it, that's exactly what the industry will try to argue. They'll say, oh, it's unworkable. We can, we'll, yeah. we'll, orphan our, we'll orphan ourselves in the national market and things like that. Mm. Um, those arguments will be attempted. There are people who will push back and make the counter argument on that. And, and even if we just, in a really simple way, we can point to the fact that already there are different maximum vet limits in different states. In Tassie, we've already brought it down from 10 to 5. Um, so we've got a history of making a similar change in that programming sense already. Uh, the, there are different spin speeds around the country in different states too. I mentioned Western Australia. Western Australia is a very small market for poker machines. They only have a certain number in one casino in the whole state. So that's a very small market. They have a spin speed rate that's different to most others um, and they seem to manage it there. So. Of course, the industry will try to say that those things are unworkable or can't be done or are too hard. Um, that, that can be pushed back on. And we'll, we're just, um, I'm certainly lining up some, some people who are well credentialed to, to push back on that argument. Uh, and one thing that's important to remember is that this industry at every single stage historically through to now has always pushed back on any kind of consumer protection or harm minimization. They fought against having clocks in the venues. You know, this is the, this is an industry that will make an argument against anything proposed to um, reduce harm, because from their perspective, that means reduced profit. Uh, so yes, we will expect those arguments, and they'll be made, and we'll, we'll try to, as as best as possible, push back on them. Can I make one other comment? I, I... What Meg said about the, the rolling 20 year license is so crucial from the point of view of uh, pub owners. At any point in time, if they have confidence that any time they require a license, they've got 20 years ahead of them, that's an unbelievable windfall to them. I just cannot, I, can, I cannot uh, emphasize how important that is from, from it would be from a, a business planning point of view. It's just an unbelievable windfall. If they've got twenty years of them every time they they buy a buy a pub, yep. yeah, yeah. So, Marina had a question or comment. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Charlie, and um, thank you, John and and Meg. I'm um, always um, yeah, take on more each time we uh, we we have a conversation about this. Um, the questions, John, um, was good to hear from from you because I hadn't heard that that, that detail as far as the super profits previously. I've got two questions. One, you talked about 
the stepped tax rate, but but you, I was losing video there, so I wasn't sure whether you were referring to the different rates between the casinos, pubs and clubs, or if there was something else you were referring to. No, no uh, what I was referring to was a similar model, say, to South Australia, mm -hmm. where, where poker machine poker machine taxes uh, they, they have they have they have stepped rates for for venues uh, uh, just a little bit like uh, individuals payg uh, rates for instance mm -hmm. you know once you get to 40,000 you pay a higher rate the margin rate right. changes up to 45 and so on and so forth so a system of step rates like that just to take the the cream off the top mm -hmm. so right. I think the highest I think the highest marginal tax rate in South Australia is something like sixty eight percent. You know, whereas our, we're, we're proposing a flat rate of uh, well forty eight, but without the GST, it's only thirty nine. Mm -hmm. So you 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 have a proposed yeah that, that that's that's what that's what I meant by step tax rate. In, in fact, I think our gaming machine I think. I think if we go back ten years, we we had a couple of step, we had a couple of steps in in our uh, in, in in our rates in our current game control act, but uh, current, but uh, lately it's been the flat rate. All right, no, thank you for that. And there was another comment that you made there. Um, I understand that point that beyond the four to five years um, of paying for the um, the license and et cetera, there's not really the requirement to have a 20 year license, but you, but you took for, for, for confidence, for the owner to sort of have the confidence well, in taking it on. But you made a point about well, long license would have a capital gain. What was that with regard to? Uh, well, uh, well the, the four to five year, the four, it, I mean, the only the only certainty that they were quite, as Meg was saying, there's a there's a sovereign risk, sovereign risk argument for for granting people a, a, a certain term, you know. But if they're not paying anything up front, you know, you don't, you don't have to. They're not investing anything else because they, they they lease their machine. If they could pay for that over four years, four or five years, that's fine. See, the the rest of the investment in in a gaming facility is just a few bar stools. There's nothing else there, you know. So they don't need any certainty. Mm. Uh, now, what was, what was your second point? Sorry, Mary. Well, uh, there was a question about you talked about a capital gain on the long license. No, wasn't sure. Oh well, the, the longer the, uh, the the way a capital gain would be worked out. If 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 if, if, if a venue is certain of making, uh, let's say, a hundred thousand super profits each year, for 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 twenty years. Mm -hmm. There's a certain formula. There's a certain formula in the hospitality industry to, to say that 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 that, uh, that license would be worth seven point five times. If if they could generate a hundred thousand dollars worth of super profits every year, that license would be worth seven hundred and fifty thousand. So rather than them hang around for for twenty years and and recoup all that and try to earn that money. They could sell it to somebody else for seven hundred and fifty thousand, and 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 that's the way you value hotels. You, you look at what the profits. You look at what the what 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 the profits are. Uh, what the what what you estimate the profits will be going forward, and you apply a certain multiple to that. You you convert you, you convert a yearly profits into a, a capital gain figure. Yep, got it. That got it. Thank, yeah, thank you. And it, it it sort of goes back to your point about. It's basically an untied grant, so it's like here's a great big yeah. 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 Well, I, I've written a lot more detail on on super profits and how you go from super profits to capital gains in a in a blog I've just posted on my Taz FinTalk site. If you want to have a look at that, it's only a short blog. Yeah, so a lot more detail there. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. No worries. Thanks, Marina. Thanks, John, for that response. Um, I've got a question about the community interest test and how that comes into this. Um, I know in um, other submissions, other people's submissions and a TAS cost submission, at least in the past, we've talked about um, if this model goes ahead, um, how the community interest test might apply. Um, are either of you able to talk about that at all? 
Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll let Meg handle it. Oh, no, it's not my area, really. That's fine. Thanks, John. Um, mm. yeah, so at the moment, what we've got in the Act is the community interest test, which would mean that any new venue that wanted to apply to have poker machines would have the community interest test applied to it prior to being allowed to do that. Um, it's never been used since it was put there back in 2016 or 17, 17, I think, um, because no new venues have put themselves forward to, to attempt to go through it. Um, the, the, the likelihood is that any new venue that put themselves forward probably wouldn't get through that community interest test. There'd be a lot of, uh, you could mobilise a lot of community sentiment against it. Local councils might, you know, would have a chance to have a say in a way they've never had before and things like that. So we've never seen it used. It's sitting there. Um, what you could, I think a, a very good argument could be mounted that we are about to issue new licences. So we've, we've got a single licence right now, which ends 30 June 2023. And from 1st of July 2023, we are issuing new licences to all the existing venues. Um, why on earth would we not apply a community interest test to the issuing of those new licences? You know, there, I think an, a, a, there's a valid argument to make to say, of course, because we have never before when those venues were first um, when, when poker machines were first put into those venues, there was no community interest test. There was no opportunity for the community to have their say about those locations. There was no opportunity for entities like local government to have a say about whether that was an appropriate location for poker machines. Um, and to address issues like concentration of poker machine venues in certain areas, that was never possible back in the day. If we're issuing new licences now, this would be an appropriate and justifiable time to apply a community interest test to uh, to those venues and to those locations. Um, just, sorry, one, Meg, sorry, just to jump in, uh, just to clarify, are you proposing then that the community interest test itself should change from instead of um, being triggered when a venue applies for a machine or an additional machine, it is triggered by a venue applying for a license. Yeah, so just to be clear, at the moment it's triggered if a venue that it doesn't currently have pokies wants to apply to become a pokies venue. So that's when it applies at the moment. Um, it's not about getting more vet, more pokies into the venue. It's about a brand new venue wanting to become a pokies venue. For yep. the um, I guess I'm making the argument that we we aren't extending licenses here that already exist because under the current um, community interest test venues that have already got poker machines don't have to go through the community interest test um, but but i would say we are actually issuing brand new licenses under a new licensing model and so i think that there there could be an argument made that the issuing of new licenses should trigger a community interest test to be applied to those venues um, and they should have to go through that process as it's, as it's described in the Gaming Act now, where um, people are able to make submissions and there's able to be consideration of whether that venue is an appropriate um, pokies, place to have a pokies venue. Um, the government have no interest in that. They've, they certainly don't have that as part of this model. They would utterly reject that. Um, uh, I think it's a valid argument to make and to throw into the mix because it helps highlight that this this total proposal is not only not in the best financial interest of our state, it's not in the best social interests of our state, and it's failing yet again to give local communities an opportunity to have a say about the presence of poker machines in their local community. So it's yet another way this, this proposal in its totality is failing to be what, what, what we might regard as responsible regulation and, and licensing of this product. And yep. similar, similarly with um, the liquor licences, Meg, where community have that opportunity. So it's not that there isn't a model that could be used. Is that one that we could reference as far as community having that that opportunity to provide um, a response and a submission? Yeah, look, absolutely. And the, 
as the community, the community interest test exists in our in our legislation right now, and it would it stays in there. I think under this new model, it's still there. But what the government is saying is they don't have to apply it when they give these new these new licenses out to individual venues. They're saying they don't have to apply it because those venues already have pokies. But but um, I'm just pushing back on the idea that that's a that's an okay thing to say. It's a new license, as far as I'm concerned. Even if under the old arrangements, those venues did have pokies. It's a new license. It's a new opportunity to actually bring into play the, the the process that exists already in our legislation to have a community interest test, which is very similar to the one that's applied to bottle shops in that sense of communities having a say. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Um, and I have another question. Um, the community support levy arrangements are going to not be in the legislation, but be addressed separately in regulations and a separate consultation has just started around that. Um, I know that there's been, I think even the SEIS has had observed that um, the measures that are funded by the community support levy aren't necessarily evidence-based. They don't necessarily, um, you know, go to harm minimization measures or support services that are actually shown to be useful or, or workable or whatever. What should we be saying about how best or how we can better use the community support levy funds? John, I don't know if you have a comments on that, but I'm happy to make some. Uh, you're on mute there, John. You're muted, John. You're going to have to unmute yourself, John. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I say, uh, I, 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 I just look upon uh, tax and CSL all, 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 all as one, all, all as one amount. Uh, I mean, from from a from a financial point of view, the the uh, the CSL it, 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 it's done that way, so it doesn't go into the public account. So when it comes out, it doesn't have to be appropriated. It just goes straight into a fund, and and like Charlie said, it'll probably be. Uh, It'll probably be controlled by by regulations, uh, and, for, and that, and that and to me. To, to, but for, from my point of view, it's just a hypothecation of a of a certain amount. And from from a, a economic and financial aspect, I don't have any more to say on it, really. Meg, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So, a couple of comments about it. Uh, under the proposed model. Um, the community support levy increases, the, 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 the levy that's applied to pubs will be 5%, to clubs is 4% and to the casino is 3%. Um, now, on top of that, the government have said that they'll tip extra money into that bucket um, to mean that it will be double the amount that it is now, essentially. Now, under the current amount, 50% of it goes to gambling support programs and gambling related research and matters that directly relate to gambling. And 50% of it goes to funding generalised things in the sport and rec sector and the community sector. Um, that's the, how it's currently divided, 50-50. They're proposing to double it, so to put another, um, sort of the same amount on top of that through their measures. The question that's completely we're in the dark about is, well, how will they be divvying up that, that doubled amount? Are they still going to keep this 50-50 arrangement? I don't think there's any argument to be made that we should continue to take that additional amount they're tipping in and through uh, uh, that additional amount that's collected through increased taxes, increased CSL tax and through what they're tipping in. That that could be applied entirely into the gambling support space and the, um, the matters relating to gambling. There's no argument that's be, that, that I think can justifiably be made to say that that should go off to fund other things. Um, we have no commitments around that from the government. It's yet to be decided what would happen to this bucket of money. My concern is that it becomes a slush fund that the government is able then to use for all sorts of things that they would like to fund in a feel good way and get kudos for, particularly around state budget time. You know, much as I love the neighbourhood houses, you know, neighbourhood houses get funding out of this bucket already. They could easily get much more for lovely feel good things that are important, but we've got to remember that money that's coming from gambling, people who are making, who are uh, experiencing losses to poker machines. And we know that half the money that goes into poker machines is coming from people who are addicted. So um, I, I feel uncomfortable about, about that 
money becoming a slush fund for any government of the day. Um, I think there should be a commitment, rock solid commitment that any additional money um, that will now be in that fund through this policy goes towards gambling support programs and gambling related matters, a local research and things like that, for example. And the thing I'd say about that is, because you mentioned, you know, whether things that are already being funded in that space are effective. Um, there's a crucial question about who decides how that money is spent. You know, who's best to decide? And at the moment, our local independent experts, the Tasmanian Liquor and Gaming Commission, they, they uh, have clear expertise and, and evidence-based um, views on effective harm minimisation and consumer protection. But they aren't the decision makers. They don't get to decide how, um, how that gambling support money and that, that gambling-related research money, they don't get to decide how that's spent. Um, the government of the day does. Through the department, through the, so the minister through the department. Um, I think that's problematic. I think it would be good for us to have um, any money we do choose to set aside through, say, the CSL that goes to gambling support and gambling related matters, harm minimisation, that kind of thing. We should ensure that that's an independent, evidence based way that's allocated. Does that is that enough said about that, Charlie? I'm not sure if I could yep. speak about it, but no, um, that's good. Yep. Yep. Just as yeah. just as a general comment too, you know, I uh, I fundamentally have an objection to, on some level, that we take this hypothecated tax, as as John describes, we take part of the state tax we're collecting from these machines, we hypothecate it, we take it across and put it in a particular bucket to allocate the spending, and and that is where we fund gambling support from. So as far as I'm concerned, that's the worst kind of user pays arrangement that we could have because half of that is coming from people who are suffering an addiction to this product. And we are, we are asking them, we're, we're not asking them, we are taking their money that is harming them, you know, the, that is being harmed, where they're being harmed, and we are using that to provide support to them. I think that's the worst kind of user pays. So I'm very uncomfortable really about that aspect of it in the first place. And the fact that then that money could then not just, not even be used for that purpose. To, to provide support back to them, but that actually be used as a slush fund. So a government of the day, whoever they are, can do feel good funding to, you know, community groups is, yep. I find it distasteful. Yep. One more question then I'm gonna let other people um, jump in. Um, the, the rationale for the different um, tax and, and community support levy, so the community support levy, pubs and clubs, casinos, what is the rationale for that? And should we be arguing that it's a flat rate across all? Uh, sorry, 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 I didn't fully understand the question. Is it the, so the, the rationale for? So the community support levy, um, the rates are different in clubs, pubs and casinos, and I don't understand yes. why. Presumably harm suffered from a poker machine is the same whether it's in a casino or a club or a pub. Absolutely. There's no there's no there's no rationale for it at all. Okay. There's no rationale whatsoever. Yeah. It all it all comes from even the even the uh, even all the casino uh, losses, they, they come from locals anyway. So it, there's no rationale whatsoever. So that's why I think of them as the CSL and the tax just as one. And you talk about it. Hmm. Sorry. You're right, Don. I didn't mean to interrupt. You finish. No, no. No, no, no. I'll finish. Yeah. Well, I was just going to add that thing on to what, John, on to what John's saying is that, um, of course, the state collected tax for poker machines is is the combination. It's, it's, it's the um, both the parts together. The tax rate that the, that the state government defined plus the CSL. It's all state collected tax. Um, yes. And, and of course, there's no there's no rationale for the tax to be different for casinos versus pubs on these machines. It's the same Tasmanian citizens losing their money, whether they're in a casino or in a pub. And if you like, what what um, what the differences of the CSL rates do? So having pubs pay a CSL of five, um, clubs four, and casinos three. That actually. I guess it exacerbates even more 
the the special concession being given to to casinos when it comes to state taxes because if we think about them as a, a joined up bucket together state tax plus csl pubs are paying 38.91 percent so that's their 33.91 percent of state tax plus their five percent csl 38.91 percent that that they're paying to the state government from the pub for their pokies the casino is paying 10.91 percent plus three percent 13.91 percent so that's the comparison that's the special discount being given in state taxes when you think of them as a package to casinos compared to pubs for no rationale. There is no reason to do that. So 38.91% compared to 13.91%. It's a shocking disparity that is just a special gift. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I agree with completely with what Meg said then. That's that's spot on. Thanks. Does anyone else have questions or comments? Is there any read then on responses from the hotel association um, on that difference? Are they just going to sort of go, well, it's a gift anyway, so we'll just take it? Uh, I, I have heard some rumblings about the, uh, the very low uh, rate of tax that casinos have paid. I've heard a few rumblings, but 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 like you say, it's uh, uh, wow. It, we, we're still getting a hell of a bonus, so we shouldn't say too much, you know. There's a, there's, I think there's an element. I think what you've said is basically correct. Yeah, they they they, they recognise the they recognise the gift that, that that federal hotels are getting, but they also ex acknowledge the gift that they're getting. I don't want to upset the boat, I guess. Mm. Meg, the, the, com the combined for the clubs then, do you have that number off the top of your head like those other two numbers? Oh, so combined for clubs, I think they're going to have 32.91 as their state bit and they're going to have four as their CSL. So what's that 36.91%? Right. Just remember It's only 1%. It's only 1% less for clubs. It's 1% yeah. less than it is for the pubs. Well, is it 2%, yeah. John? Because I think their proposed new tax rate is 32.91 instead of 33.91. And so I think they've got 1% less there and they get 1% less on the CSL. So I think it's 2% down from the pubs. The oh, sorry, that, you're correct. Yeah, it's 2%, think, yes, yes, the yes. The thing to remember, Marina, is that the when we talk about clubs, operating pokies in Tassie, it's a tiny, tiny number. There's like four or five left now. Like there's, there's virtually yeah. no clubs. It's only about 100. You're right. It's only about 100 machines. It's not much at all. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So they're a very it's, small it's, part it's, of the Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and interestingly yeah. enough, even though there's only a small handful of them, um, again, we have absolutely no modelling as to what impact we would expect this proposal in its totality to have on a club and whether it's even viable for them to have machines anymore. Because they would have, as John says, they've got a small number of machines. Each venue has a relatively small number of machines. A lot of the, those clubs, I think, then only must have under 20 machines. They're probably not high-earning machines. No, they're not going to be like the machines uh, that in the L week and whatever. So venues that have a small number of fairly low-earning machines under this model, they're still going to have all their fixed costs there. And so what they actually end up with in terms of profit and whether they're actually viable. Um, and then when you add in the compliance headache that they now have to face because they're responsible for all of it, um, I, I, I suspect clubs are going to be really, really pinched by this, this model, actually. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll find, I'll find a lot of difficulty financing the machines. It's very difficult for a club, you know, which are, they're basically incorporated associations. It's much harder for a club to to gain access to cheap finance, if, 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 especially if they haven't got much real estate security and direct, directors or committee people aren't going to offer their, their aren't going to give personal guarantees, it's, it's, it, it, they're going to have to pay high, higher rates to finance their machines. So what Meg says is, is, is correct. And we, we, saw, we saw the Glenorchy RSL uh, uh, wind up and that 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 was uh, that was an accident waiting to happen for for years and years and years 
Uh, and there are there are lots of others that aren't much much better than that. But in my in my hometown, Wynyard, they, they closed down their uh, poker machines probably three or four years ago, and, and there have been several others. So it's a the pattern will be repeated. My my, 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 my thought is that maybe you know what may happen if one of the aggregators move in into clubs. You know, it's possible for an aggregator. When I say an aggregator, I mean one of these one of these larger conglomerates that uh, taking advantage of the of the new cap, the the new five hundred and eighty seven cap limit, that an aggregator might move in and take take over some of the the uh, take over some of the EGMs in a club. Uh, and that, that would be, you know, I, 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 I don't think that's uh, the, 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 the longest shot possibility. I think something like that might occur. And I, can I pick up on that and just mention that, you know, we may not, you know, we may see it as a positive outcome, some of us, that, that, that eventually some of these clubs that do remain with pokies, they may actually exit, exit the pokie space altogether as a result of this. That could, to some extent, be a positive. However, the point I would I would make about it in this context is it's yet another way that we haven't seen the government provide any clarity about what their expected impact is from this new model. This model will change the shape of the industry. It's inevitable. It will. The government must have, have done modelling for themselves about what that expected change of shape would look like. They must know what they're driving towards with this, and they have shared none of that publicly. They've, they've, uh, kept, they've kept completely silent on what they're engineering in terms of a change of shape to this industry. And I think that's really deceitful. And I think, it, I think they haven't even consulted with those smaller entities in the industry about it. They've got no idea. And they're really just colluded with the big interests in the industry. It's designed around the big interests. And it's, I think it's, it's unconscionable that they would take this through legislation and legislate for it without actually sharing their understanding of what impact and them, their expectation about what impact it will have on the shape of the industry into the future. Because those are things we should be taking into account now when we're deciding, is this the right way forward? We should know what their expected outcomes are from it in terms of the shape of the industry. Just on that club thing, just on that club thing, one, one small point. Uh, although no clubs have, have 40 machines, the legislation allows them to have up to 40 machines. Pubs are only allowed 30, but clubs are clubs can have up to 40. None have ever, none have ever been up to 40. Uh, but that they've retained that in the legislation. What why they have is is what one can only what one can only speculate that something else in mind. Most most clubs have have less less than thirty. They don't even have thirty. Uh, most clubs would have fifteen, twenty, something like that. There's a few with thirty, but none have forty. Why have they retained that forty maximum? What what is the gov like Meg says? What has the government got in mind? Meg, yeah. Do you mind if I just pick up on something else there that we haven't touched on yet? Actually, and I think this is a really good moment to bring it in. And that is another thing that's allowed under this model. And, and again, it's the first time we'll see this being possible in the state. And so therefore we should know what the government expects to see happen by allowing this to occur. Here's the thing. Under this new model, if I'm an owner that has multiple venues, uh, I can move pokey machines around across my venues. As long as I stay within the venue cap, so the venue cap, as John was just saying then, venue cap for a club is 40, the venue cap for a pub is 30 machines. But if I've got venues and they're not at that cap limit yet, I can move under this model, I can move pokies around. So if I've got a venue located somewhere that's quite lucrative, where the, the losses per machine are quite high, and I'm not yet at my maximum cap for that venue, let's say I've got 25 machines there instead of my 30. Well, if I buy a venue over here where the machines don't make much at all and aren't really worthwhile, I can shift five machines across into this venue and get maximum profit from each of those machines. Um, that's a new scenario for us here. It's a new scenario. It does allow for a movement and a, and a concentration of poker machines themselves that we haven't had the opportunity to see play out before here. Um, 
the thing that I would point to about that, and I've only done this quickest of looks, when we think about where machines are already concentrated, you know, we always think of Glenorchy as being, um, you know, ground zero, the golden mile. Every venue in Glenorchy is at their cap. So this new arrangement that allows shifting machines won't affect Glenorchy because they can't have any more machines moved in there anyway. They're all at 30 machines. When I did a quick look, because um, the next highest LGA losses come from Launceston and from Devonport. And I didn't have, I think Devonport is relatively full already in terms of at, at their maximum. But in Launceston, there's a number of venues in the Launceston LGA or Launceston area that aren't yet at their venue cap. So if there's common ownership and people can shift machines, I would have thought I would have thought that centrally in Launceston, where there's still some some space for filling up um, the venue cap of the machines, that's a prime area where we'll see more concentration of machines. And if they did that, and on my estimation, it's about they might be able to add about another ten percent of machines into there potentially, a bit less I think. But if Launceston losses would it would have got by ten percent because we had an extra ten percent of machines on what we've got now. It would put them past Glenorchy on the latest figures in losses. So one system would become the new ground zero, for example. Um, and that's just my really quick look. So that's not gospel, but I think it just demonstrates that this introduction of this new, new possibility of shifting machines amongst venues of common ownership. There must be some modelling about what impact that might have. They must, the government must have an understanding about what they're allowing and setting up to happen with that. And they're not sharing that. They haven't even sort of flagged that as, as um, any kind of potential risk, but I certainly see it as a risk. Can, can I just add that? Those, oh, sorry. So if they can... Oh, can I just quick, sorry. Oh. Uh, you, you go, sorry, so you oh, go. Um, so if you can move those machines over, does that mean they have to apply to do that or they can just randomly move them so under the under the policy as it's written and, and the legislation as it's written if they own both venues yeah. as long as they stay under the cap they can move machines but i don't believe they even have to get permission about that they would have to probably notify the regulator that they're doing because they'd have to notify the number of machines at each venue but my understanding is it's there's not a there's no permission that's required it, it allows for that movement as long as you haven't exceeded the, the venue cap. Okay, thanks. Hmm. Now, can I just say something on that? When you talk about common ownership, you, you, you've got to remember that ownership doesn't necessarily mean freehold ownership. Ownership could mean they just run the pub. So a, a club could remain as is, uh, a, pub, a pub could remain as is, the the, the 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 gaming operations could be sold to somebody else. So that that's the way aggregation will probably work in the future. Pub ownership necessarily won't won't change, but they'll just outsource. They'll sell their, they'll sell the, the gaming part of their business. So that's the way you can achieve common ownership. You don't have to sell the pubs. You know, a club. Someone might come along to an say to Say to a club, this is this club's in a great position. You, we've got a, we could possibly move in forty machines into this place. We, we, we're, we're not going to, we're not going to buy it off the RSL, off the return servicemen people. We'll, we'll just, we'll just lease it from you. That's the way, that's the way aggregation will work. They won't necessarily acquire freehold ownership. Common ownership will, will, will occur through having, having an interest in these pubs, but not necessarily a freehold interest. All right. Um, I just want to pick up on a comment in the chat. I think it was from Andrea saying um, yesterday the Queensland government announced a four year plan to minimise gambling harm with an emphasis on industry social responsibility. Um, those words that don't strike a lot of confidence generally. Does anyone, um, Andrea, can you expand on that or does anyone have any um, more knowledge about that, what we think about? No, I don't. Yeah, I, I don't have a great deal of information, but I was reading an article. I just thought it was um, potentially interesting. Just I was reading an article on the ABC News yesterday and they were talking about problem gambling spiralling um, across Queensland after the COVID lift downs um, and um, EGMs being turned back on. And 
Yeah, so they're looking now at, apparently the government's looking at a, some sort of plan to, to minimise gambling harm. And I think Meg's already mentioned that New South Wales is doing a similar thing. Um, but Tasmania's clearly not in that space at the moment. So I just thought it was an interesting point, I guess. Um, it's, Margie, it's Margie here. Um, unfortunately, I think it is just government spin. It's their responsible gambling week right now. Um, so they have to have something to announce um, during Responsible Gambling Week. Um, and the governments do a four-year plan every four years um, to do with gambling harm. Um, our gambling support program does as well. Um, and so how effective the one that's been announced in Queensland is, I, I don't know. Um, I have had a look at it, um, but it, I, yeah, I... I I think it's just government spin during Responsible Gambling Week. And on that, Maggie, I don't know, um, the New South Wales situation is, I think, a little different. It, it, in some ways, it would appear that there is a genuine interest in the state government of New South Wales to doing new things in harm minimisation. They've got a draft um, piece of legislation at the moment for consultation. Um, and that does look like it holds some interesting things. They're coming off a really low base because their harm minimization is, you know, at, at a really low bar to start with. But they are contemplating things that probably we've never seen contemplated before um, in the space, which is positive, but still has a long way to play out before we see whether it actually makes it through. Margie, Margie's had more of a close look at that than I have. Um, so she might have a comment. But if we were to look anywhere and see um, where opportunity might lie, I think New South Wales is an interesting place at the moment. Um, yeah, like you say, Meg, they're on a very, very low base, um, given the numbers of machines uh, and how they've regulated in the past. <laughs> um, but I think every you, we could actually look at nearly every state, um, including Tasmania, uh, as to you know what's what's being done, every state likes to claim that their world best practice or Australia's best practice or mainland best practice. Um, you know, Victoria now has LGA caps. Um, there's only two jurisdictions with LGA caps. That would be something if Tasmania wanted to be Australia's best that we could introduce. Um, New South Wales is looking at advanced training for people on duty, um, whereas Tasmania is not looking at any new training um, requirements. In fact, I'm not sure how it will affect uh, venues in Tasmania, but they're, <clears throat> they're saying now that they don't need to notify the commission that they've got uh, certified staff. Um, and I presume it will just come down to when the commission comes in and checks on them, if they have people who aren't certified, then they'll get a fine or a, a notice. But uh, the, it, the industry said it was too, too much work for them to notify every time someone got certified or became uncertified. And so that's in this new legislation to make it easier for industry, not to actually make it uh, uh, more safe, like safer for, for people in the in the hotel. Um, and then there is the, the old self-exclusion debate as to whether Tasmania's model where you have to go to a counsellor to get excluded or the New South Wales model, which is they're going to introduce an online portal. Um, there's debates both ways as to whether it's better that a person who wants to exclude um, talks to a counsellor because they then get some uh, active intervention or whether it's better that you can do it online, which is instant. You don't have to wait for your um, uh, appointment. Um, I don't really necessarily have a, um, an opinion either way, but I think it's a, a good conversation to have and this legislative process hasn't raised it as an issue to, to discuss. Thanks, Maggie. Um, just noting the time, it's four minutes to the end of the session. Um, I've certainly 
um, benefited greatly from this. It's been fantastic. Um, before we wrap up, does anyone else have uh, questions or comments they want to raise? All righty. Well, I would like to thank John and Meg for your time and knowledge and expertise and commitment to this issue. Uh, massive one for Tasmania. And I'd like to um, also thank everyone who took the time out of your morning to come and listen. Really encourage you to make submissions and uh, to um, perhaps encourage other people you know to make submissions as well. They don't have to be detailed, they don't have to be footnoted, all that kind of thing. But the more submissions the government receives on this, um, emphasising some of the issues we've talked about this morning, um, the more chance obviously we have of getting legislation that um, might create fewer harms in the community than would currently be the case. Um, the session, as we said, has been recorded. So as a participant, you'll automatically receive a link to the recording. So please feel free to share this around your networks and uh, at the same time, yeah, encourage people to, to have their say. Um, keep your eye out for the community service levy consultation as well. I think it's probably, I think it's on the same website. Um, don't quote me on that but we can send that link out as well with the, uh, with the link to the recording. So you can make comments about how you think that should be used as well. Um, so yeah, that's, that's it for this morning. Thanks again. And um, feel free also to share submissions or oh, just got, oh yeah, Meg, you're saying your website has some simple resources and info for submissions. Um, I've had a look at those. They're fantastic, some fact sheets and things. So I encourage everyone to go and have a look at those and use them. Um, and yeah, uh, thanks again. Good luck with the submissions. Good luck everyone with continuing this fight. And uh, we'll see you next time.